years ago, sustainability was part of the founding ethos. But I think that um, Peter and Keith wouldn't mind my saying that Architects Declare has prompted the practice to take a good look at this and push things forward. And today's, uh, you'll find all the links for the seminars on the Material Matters website. Part of Architects Declare is about knowledge sharing, and that's also what this afternoon is about. And um, before we go any further, we were going to try to figure out who we've got. I, I, so we were going to try and see if we could have a show of hands. How many architects are here? Is there a way to make a poll? I, don't I think if, if people can just put their answers in the chat, that would give us an idea. Put your answer in the chat box. I thought there was a way to raise your hand, but we haven't perfected it. Yeah, um, raising their hands, they're raising their hands. Okay, let me go to the gallery view and get a sense of what's going on. How do I see every, I can't see 110 people. Uh, one second. All right, let's move on. I can't wait to go. 24. 24 out of 110. How many structural engineers we got? Okay, what about service engineers? And students? Okay, one last question, and this is for everybody. How many of you have been directly involved in a project with an embodied carbon analysis carried out? I'd be really interested to get a sense of that once you're able to tally it up. I think we had about 17. Okay, great. Now, I'd like to share my screen. I have about four slides to show you before we move on to the speakers. Can I share? Yep, yep. Great. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of how fast, how quickly things are moving from my vantage point. Five years ago, when the UK GBC did a task, set up a task force on embodied carbon, barely anyone in the industry knew what it was. And I would say that um, Simon Sturgis almost single-handedly has been responsible for putting this on the map in, in London and in the UK. Uh, many of you will know his book, Targeting Zero. He's now uh, um, leading a, a network called the Whole Life Carbon Network, where people are they're specific work streams looking at very technical aspects of this and I'd urge you to get involved if you'd like to contribute. The um, ASPB always leading the charge they had a seminar a few weeks ago on embodied carbon tools of which there are now a handful and I er, that webinar is also available on their website and ACAN the Architects Climate Awareness Network which many of you will know their embodied carbon work stream is one of the most active and they led the charge on the recent consultation about structural timber and fire and they now want to look at what's happening abroad in terms of embodied carbon and bring some of that knowledge uh, to the UK. Um, let's just see. Can't seem to move forward. Oh, um, at, the, at the AJ, we've also been talking a lot about embodied carbon and in particular about whole life carbon. This is an issue from last year. My colleague, Will Hurst, was instrumental in putting this together. And really, we need to be looking at whole life and embodied carbon. Um, retro first. Obviously, we save the most carbon if we retrofit the buildings we've already got. I don't know how many of you know this project in Poplar. 
it's quite remarkable. It's a retrofit, office retrofit, where the interior atrium has been um, largely filled in. That's a before and after with a CLT structure, a kind of interior facade workspace. Um, I put this in as a bit of a provocation. We're talking about materials today. Don't know how many of you have read this book. I finished it during lockdown. This is my, it's a 600 pager. This is my ear, ear dog-eared copy. It's, it's all about the love of trees. We all love trees. We all think we should be using more timber, but the question is, is that really right for every project? Perfect. Now we're gonna move on to the next speaker. Each speaker is gonna present for 10 minutes. I'm gonna give you a two minute warning uh, before at, at the end of eight minutes. And at the end, we will have a question and answer. Please put your questions in the chat box uh, because uh, there are two people on from Field and Clegg who are gonna be fielding the questions and feeding them to me. And we'll have ample time for questions at the end of the presentations. Um, I think this is a particularly expert group of people to speak in depth about materials, which is, I think, what architects really need to get to grips with. So um, the first speaker is Eve McNamara from Expedition Engineering. She's a structural engineer. Um, she's an associate at um, Expedition, and she was part of the UK GBC Future Leaders Group a few years ago. I've come across many of these people in my work on sustainability because it really, I think, leading the charge is, is really what everyone should be doing. So, um, Eva, let's hear about concrete and steel from you. Great, thank you. I think you need to stop sharing your screen. Right. Great, and I'll take over. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so, share. Is everyone able to see my screen now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for that introduction, Hattie. I'm going to talk about uh, steel and concrete, which are a massive part of our industry. So although there's a bunch of good and emerging materials coming out that are definitely lower in carbon, I think understanding how we work with these materials now is really important. So that's what I'm going to go through today. Um, so to understand that impact, uh, if steel and concrete were countries, carbon emitting countries, they would be the third, fourth largest um, carbon emitters in the world. So after China and the US would come steel and concrete. So that really shows um, how big this problem is and how much emissions are really to do with our industry. Um, so today we're all going to kind of um, speak about the different parts of what makes up embodied carbon. Um, and I find this diagram, um, which was um, put together by Na Dr. Natasha Watson, um, based on the, um, the sustainability of construction works, the BSEEN 15804. Um, and basically why, why I like this diagram so much is on this right hand side, basically it shows how um, everything that goes into the cradle to gate part of the embodied carbon process, which is often what you hear talked about. But then inside this bigger circle here is all, all, everything we must think about in terms of making our designs and our materials work in a circular way. So what happens in terms of whole life um, in the use, the maintenance, re the repair of those structures? Uh, what do we do at of life disposal and how can we reuse those things so I when I'm designing I like to look back at this and kind of think how am I um, making the best of my design in all of those different areas so um, this is, is a complicated diagram and I'm not going to go through it in detail um, but I just wanted to um, alert you to the reasons why steel has such a high embodied carbon um, and essentially so um, iron ore, coke and limestone go into making steel and if you can see all of these hot areas on this uh, map basically those are all really carbon intensive processes really high energy furnaces about 1500 degrees that go into making it. Um, I want to, I'll come back to this later, but I just want to draw your attention to um, two different things here. So you've got basic oxygen steel making. So that basically has virgin steel coming through it and only uses maybe 10 to 15 percent of scrap steel can go back into that. In contrast with the um, an electric arc furnace, which basically takes 100 percent scrap or up to 100 percent, so 90 to 100 percent um, scrap steel in there and um, uses greener energy often to produce to, to get that steel again. Um, 
so then concrete so sorry the way i'm going to do my talk is flip between the two materials as we go along um i hope that's useful um but i had to try and find a diagram to show you how do you make concrete and actually I, what i thought was quite interesting is um the diagrams aren't very modern and basically that shows that we haven't really changed very much about our modern industrial production of concrete in the last few decades um so this diagram still stands so um in putting together concrete we've got cement sand water and and uh, gravel or stone and um, cement is the high embodied carbon part of um, concrete so over on the left hand side here you can see um, that again it's going through a kiln that is heated up to a very high temperature so um, using a lot of high embodied carbon energy there uh, and also in the chemical process that produces it you've got um, carbon emissions associated with that um, I'm not going to dwell on transport uh, but that's something we should all consider in all of the materials that we're specifying um, that will always contribute. Um, so how are these materials used? Um, we're all familiar with uh, how they are kind of typically used in our um, industry, but actually how much of the steel that is produced globally is used in our industry. And actually, it's uh, quite surprisingly high. It's 51% for buildings and infrastructure. So again, that's really saying that um, we need to think responsibly about how we supply it. Um, remembering again that steel was the kind of third biggest country if it were a carbon emitter. Uh, Okay, and concrete, not such a nice diagram, but uh, basically almost all of the cements, that high embodied carbon cement that goes into the concrete is used in the construction industry. Um, so uh, yeah, very high processes. So um, we need to think about how to use these materials, but in a better and low carbon way. Um, and recognise that we are going to probably continue designing in steel and concrete for quite a long time. So how do we do that better? So um, next to talk about end of life or next life. So thinking about circular economy principles. So historically, we kind of use a linear economy that take, make, dispose. To get the best out of concrete and steel, we need to really think about that circular economy principle and how to reuse in its highest most valuable way so for a steel beam for example that would be reusing it as a steel beam as it is uh, same for concrete but obviously we don't do that very much so to understand the reality of what we do now almost 100 percent of steel that comes to its end of life is recycled rather than reused um, and if you remember i talked to you about that electric arc furnace so scrap steel can go back into that lower energy process and come out as a kind of um, you know lower lower embodied carbon for that next use um, in compared in comparison with virgin steel um, but you know that that's still melting it down um, and concrete is almost never reused in its kind of high grade version as in in itself originally and most often is recycled as um, rubble from building sites and uh, that goes into kind of landscaping roads maybe used as a piling mat um, that sort of thing so um, we're not there yet we need to think of alternatives for these so perhaps with concrete it might be something like saying um, if we do post-tension concrete um, because when we try to separate concrete from reinforcement it's really difficult that's why we don't really use, reuse it very much so if we do post-tension concrete where we don't bond in with the um, reinforcement we could maybe take those parts those things apart and reuse them um, more easily for steel have better inventories between um, developments of what people have got and what people can share because you know very often we're specifying an off-the-shelf um, beam so why aren't we doing better at reusing those things um, so I just want to cover you a couple of um, examples um, of design. So if we think holistically about how to kind of achieve o our overall aim of reducing the embodied um, minutes, environment. Two Sorry? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Reducing the um, embodied environmental impact of building structures. We've got the lifetime structural engineering. So we want to think about um, the durability of the structural elements, maintenance, future flexibility, design for deconstruction, and then in the eco-efficiency of the structure, putting material in the right place and with the right specification of material. So here, which of these two would you think would have the lowest embodied carbon? You'd probably think it would be the section here, which has about 25% um, less material in it. But actually, because this um, 
this beam here is made up of plated section. Plated steelwork can only currently come from, through the um, virgin steel making process, whereas hot rolled sections like that I beam at the I beam at the top can come through that electric arc furnace that can use 100% recycled steel. So actually that section's got the lowest embodied carbon and this one's got the highest embodied carbon and you'd have to lose about 50% of the material before you became more carbon efficient um, using a tapered section. So I think that's a really interesting discussion we should be having as design teams. It's not just necessarily about looking at reducing materials, it's about how our um, products come about. The second example is just thinking about when we've got a new low um, opportunity with a low carbon material. So for example, in concrete, there are geopolymer concretes which don't include cement. And um, we wanted to make use of the fact that the properties have higher tensile strength. So we're working with Network Rail at the moment who are really great with their decarbonisation programme. And one of the things is they have premature degradation of their copers quite a lot because there's a lot of um, abundance use of de-icing salts in the winter which basically mean the reinforcement is degrading and then these um, you're having to prematurely replace it and going for whole life uh, that really affects the whole life carbon so in uh, this bend test up here you can see an unreinforced uh, panel and how well it's performing um, in this bend test so we're looking at taking out the reinforcement so that we don't get premature degradation so actually we end up with a better whole life solution so that you don't have to replace um, that element over over and over again. So what I just say is um, seek new materials with differing properties that might solve other problems that lead to whole, whole, lower whole life carbon and um, check that your good intentions really do end up with a lower embodied carbon. So collaborate with your design team and seek the help of experts um, to move things forward because there's new emerging technologies all the time and we're all learning on this subject. Thank you. Sorry, Hattie, I can't. Sorry, uh, I, was, I was muted. I think the example of the steel beam is really fascinating because it shows you exactly how complicated this is. And your message about collaboration is just so much on message. I mean, I've been writing about this for more than a decade and banging on about it. You know, we just have, to, from the very beginning of a project, have to brainstorm what's the best way forward. Um, okay, now we're going over to to Timber. And uh, we've got Nick Hodges, who is from the Bath office of uh, Field and Clegg, and I think he's one of the sustainability leaders at, at a sustainable practice. So he is going to talk to us about various different aspects of, of Timber. Thanks, Hattie. Um, I hope everyone can see this okay. Oh, skip the slide, of course. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk about uh, some of the issues around uh, how we use timber, um, and I suppose the the easy thing for me for me to say would be I've got you know I've got a dead easy task. Uh, you know, we 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 all think timber is going to be the solution to all our problems. It's carbon negative, um, and you know as a practice we've been looking at, at this on a number of projects um, about how the use of uh, things like CLT can offset um, other materials. So as a sort of headline run through, I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, carbon negative sequestration issue, a bit about how we use timber, different ways, um, sort of considering supply and then disposal, which I think is, is a really relevant question, particularly as we move sort of into the next phase of our uh, works as hopefully uh, low and zero carbon uh, architects and designers and uh, builders, and then some of the current issues in timber. Um, and just as an Im image there is from one of our projects uh, where we've been looking at the impact of CLT on uh, on the carbon footprint and how it might relate to other other um, processes such as passive house and Brio. So if we do take the position that, uh, that we need, you know, obviously we all take a position we want, we need to have a, a low and uh, low carbon, zero carbon buildings. Um, if we want to achieve that, then the, the best way would be to start neg carbon negative and stay carbon negative. Um, the hardest way around is to start carbon positive and then try and drive the operational carbon to the point where after its operational life, we end up being in a carbon negative position. And you know, with my lucky hat of the uh, timber industry on my head today, I can say, well, it's great, isn't it? Isn't it really super? Wood sequesters carbon, 
compared to the other major manufacturers, uh, major processes, you know, th there's your answer. We still use more timber, problem solved. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be a little, perhaps a little bit more measured than that, which is, you know, there's a lot of conversations about how real that is. Um, quite a few um, sort of ways of, of, of analysing that or cutting up that cake and, um, you know, whether you just take you do you do say there is some co2 there or you say there is some sequestration or sequestration plus the next growth of timber um and i think you have to sort of come to some place of peace with it um in terms of how you're doing your own carbon analysis as a practice we've sort of landed on that middle ground we, we think there is some sequestration to take into account for uh, that is useful uh, but we don't think we can quite go to the the far end of including the, ne the next tree because i think we probably feel the next tree will get used as well and if we're talking about sequestration, well, when's the best time to, to use that timber? Um, and obviously this has a big impact on where you get it from, um, the uh, sorts of managed forests particularly that we'll, we'll be engaging with. Um, and it looks like for a, you know, a softwood spruce tree uh, on a two meter spacing in a managed forest, you're looking at about 50 years as an optimum harvesting point. And that's when the uh, sequestration of carbon or carbon absorbed starts to sort of tip over and sort of flatten out a bit for the later part of the tree's life. So it gives you a sense of where, you know, how, how long this tree will have to be there before we get our, our hands on it. But, you know, then, sort of then stepping back to the whole, the whole sort of timber industry, you know, how we use timber, well, it, we've used it for a very long time and historically we used it as framing. Um, but as the industry has evolved, in particular over the last 150 years, we've seen more uh, engineering of timber, we've seen more uh, looking into how timber can be maximised or the tree can be maximised. And so there's early generations of things like glue lambs and plywoods, we've moved into um, CLTs, wood wool insulation um, and timber fibre board insulation boards, um, things like shingles, internal joinery. And I think, you know, we are very good at maximising um, what we get from those trees um, and se essentially we can do it to to make almost anything in a building apart from the foundation so from most of the most experiences that we all have I think um, and it's a variety of different approaches as well from balloon framing to CLT almost like a sort of cardboard cutout where you get all the holes cut out for the walls and windows and, and just land it on site so it is a very efficiently used material um, when we get it but the other question is where is it and I think, again, those of us in the industry, we're fairly used to seeing you know, those big producers in Germany, Sweden, Finland, Austria leading the way. Um, these are the um, sort of production from sawn and roundwood production in, in the EU over the last, around about the last 10 years. Um, you know, the UK sort of sitting down there with quite a low figure. And for those of us working in, in the UK using higher quantities of timber, particularly in CLT and other uh, structured elements, you know, we, we're, I think, most of us should be aware of those issues around transport. Um, you know, where is it and the quantity of it that we're going to be working? How are we going to get it to our sites? Um, not to say there's a, a question left about that, but if we're bringing it in from Austria, we've got to drive it in on a big truck. It's, it's not necessarily the most sustainable thing. And have we got the availability and the control? Um, the UK historically had a lot of forests, but we cut them down and used them for making ships. Uh, and they were often hardwood forests. Um, those sorts of materials, we need to sort of think about how we engage in them. And also biodiversity. If you've got a, um, a source of softwood, a very bio, you know, potentially a, a limited monobio culture of very closely packed um, softwood trees, are we getting the best out of um, growing trees that are sequestering carbon and helping with the broader climate crisis versus not having the biodiversity we want. Um, those growth periods, that 50 years, it being a sustainable resource, it being the right sort of timbers that we want to use.